All right, welcome everyone. My name is Allie and I am on the programming um, committee and I'm really excited to kick off our first panel today with um, the electoral panel and we're glad you're all here. It is going to be facilitated by Wameek and I'm gonna let you take it over. All right, thank you all so much for coming. Um, if you uh, weren't here for, the, for my remarks this morning, um, how very dare you, but in that case, I will introduce myself again. My name is Wameek Jodhri. I'm a member of North Carolina Triangle DSA, and I am the chair of the endorsement subcommittee of the NEC. Um, so I'm really excited to be facilitating this panel today. We have an all-star cast of electoral organizers. One of the things that I really love about doing endorsements in the NEC, for the NEC is that it is constantly putting me in contact with the electoral organizers all across the country. And no matter how much you think you know, you're, you can always learn more from your comrades. There are, there are always people who are taking on fights, trying out new tactics, doing incredible things, and it's really inspiring. And like I said this morning, we win. So we've got some incredible folks here today who are going to be talking about some of their experiences, about some of the challenges that our organization faces as we develop, as we develop our electoral program. Um, so let's pass it on down the line and how about um, everybody introduces themselves, names, pronouns, chapter, role, um, and talk a little bit about your area of electoral work and your favorite DSA electoral story of the past two years. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sandy Barnard. I use she, her pronouns, and I've served for just over a year as the chair of the Chicago DSA Political Action Committee, or PAC. Um, before that, in 2018, I was co-chair of the Electoral Committee in East Bay DSA and our campaign to elect Javanka Beckles to the California State Assembly. Um, outside of DSA, I used to be a legislative aide for a progressive city council member, and I led the charge in unionizing those legislative aides. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit... Yeah, get, <laughs> love union ledge aides, love that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more later about how we operated our PAC, um, but just for an introductory favorite story, I'm just going to leave it at Chicago DSA supporting our awesome new older woman, Angela Clay, to the tune of $20,623, a sum larger than a lot of most other progressive organizations or unions in the city were able to give her. Hello, um, my name is Zara Kane, she, her. I'm from the Maine DSA. I'm the campaign treasurer for the Maine DSA campaign for a livable Portland ballot question committee. Um, I have substantially less electoral experience than everyone else up here and probably a lot of you in the audience. Uh, but I guess what I'd like to speak to with my experiences today is how DSA was able to just throw me into the deep end and let it happen. We were able to run an extremely successful campaign in the first half of this um, year, we'll be running another one in November to defeat yet another reactionary ballot question campaign fielded by the Southern Maine Landlords Association. And I don't think I would have gotten involved with any of it were it not for the, um, the incredible ground game that we have at the Maine DSA and their, their capacity to develop new leaders. Thank you. Okay. We can use this one too, okay, cool. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Tasha Van Auken, she, her from NYC DSA. Um, my electoral experience uh, in the organization started with the Brooklyn Electoral Working Group in 2017 and working along with um, a bunch of amazing people to help build that working group um, and run many campaigns over the last few years. Um, I managed Julia Salazar's uh, 2018 campaign and Ferris Souffrant Forest's 2020 campaign. Um, and then also was very lucky to work with Farah um, in the New York State Assembly um, and the initial year of the so New York Socialist in Office Committee, which was very exciting. Um, and I've also, I also did work on the first Tax the Rich campaign, which I think is very connected and relevant to our, our electoral work and priorities. Um, I was thinking a lot about what my favorite story from the last two years is, and I think there's, there's a lot of really cool things that have happened um, as we've like grown and developed. And I think the one I want to call out is just Sarah Hanna Shrestha's campaign um, in Hudson Valley. Um, 
I was not embedded in it, um, but I was lucky enough to work a bit with the campaign and just saw them run this insanely dogged campaign and field, field game for a very long time leading up to the race and watching a campaign like that and the chapter build, um, build a, a story and narrative and talk to so many people throughout the district and then, and then pull through and win that race was a really exciting and inspiring thing. Hey y'all, my name is uh, Tandra Louie, she, her, from Austin, Texas, and I joined DSA, I think, 2017, yeah, 2017, uh, my chapter was working on an affordable housing bond, um, something up to like $200 million, and that's when I first got my uh, door knocking experience, and it was really great, and we won. Um, and my most recent favorite memory is, uh, recently we were working on a police oversight committee, and then uh, our lovely police officers in Austin decided to do uh, their own petition. They stole some of our language and they deceived a bunch of people in the community, which worked out for us because now more people in Austin realize that cops are dirty liars and it's really great. Uh, so, with the messaging, we had to be very deliberate. We had, to, we had to go to the doors and tell people you had to vote yes on A and no on B. If you vote both of them, they cancel each other out. It goes to the judge. We're never going to get an oversight committee. Because we were so deliberate about the messaging, we won 80 to 20%, and it was really great. This is amazing. I'm already feeling incredibly inspired and we've just started. So I'm excited to dig in a little bit more. So this first question, you know, when we think about how we engage in electoral politics and the electoral organizing as socialists, it's something that kind of like immediately brings to the fore a number of contradictions, obviously, because, you know, we are talking about wanting to change the system. But when we organize electorally, there is an extent to which we're working within the system. And so this first question for the panel, um, I'd love to hear um, what all of y'all think about how should we as socialists engage in electoral work? So like I said, um, I'm the PAC chair, I'm the money gal. I have a lot of thoughts about how to address this question generally, but I can limit my, my responses to being from the perspective of money gal. Um, and with the caveat, that 50 states means 50 different uh, electoral compliance laws, and I want everyone to follow the law to the best of their ability. With that caveat uh, uh, in place, I have to say that you need to be raising money to seriously level up your electoral work. No, we will never have as much money as the capitalists. That is true. But having money is crucial to running a quality program with quality literature and high visibility. And it is a powerful tool when we talk about disciplining elected officials. More on that later. Um, but in Chicago, we raised over $50,000 from over 300 unique donors for our 10 endorsed aldermanic candidates. The money was used to purchase explicitly socialist lit for DSA-run canvases. It was used for space rental for events and victory parties. And it was used for checks given directly to the candidates, little walking around money. Mm -hmm. um, and people noticed. It was really excited to, uh, exciting to attend canvases and have sitting elected officials say, oh, there's the DSA PAC person. They paid for the pizza we have this afternoon. Like people knew, people noticed. It really helped our visibility as an organization as well as helping the visibility of the, or, of the candidates we had endorsed. And I, I do wanna say that money is not a substitute for canvassing and, and putting in your time. But if you are able to have a quality um, a, a volunteer organization, money on top of that is huge. It is really how you level up. As Wamik has alluded to, electoral work as a socialist is steeped in contradiction. You can't vote your way into socialism, what I believe electoral work is the most effective for is for base building. It feels really, really goddamn good to win. And people know that. That's understood by people inside of the organization and without. Um, to be, when you're on the outside of that, you'll eventually notice. Um, we've been lucky to win many of our referendums. 
in Portland. We've done many of that on what is comparatively a shoestring budget. During this last referendum campaign, we were outspent about 20 to 1. Um, and the bitter reality to that is that the Southern Maine Landlords Association and the Maine Association of Realtors can afford to do that every single election cycle. But if they keep losing, eventually they're going to be a little bit more tight-fisted. Um, on the as a tool for base building, that, um, excuse me, uh, that needs to be the primary focus of your electoral campaigns. Every single electoral campaign is going to feel like the end of the world. It will always feel like the stakes are as high as they could possibly be. Um, that's especially true for defensive campaigns. But throughout that process, regardless of the money comes, that comes into it or the outcome that is produced at the ballot, you need to prioritize the health of the organization because when that floor falls out, there is not a way to pull it back up. Um, so I, uh, I, I, I like to... Uh, sort of think of electoral work. You know, I don't do, I don't personally do electoral work because I think elections are the most important aspect of everything um, and, and, and have always like loved working on campaigns. I think the thing that's always drawn me to campaigns and elections is that for most people out there, that is the main touch point to politics. And I think for us, when we talk about growing and bringing people in, politicizing people, hopefully for the long term and not just for a single campaign, elections are a place where that, that happens. Um, it happens a lot. Um, so I think it's really important as socialists for us to think about how is everything we're doing bringing people in, bringing new people in, and then also how is everything we're doing elevating new people into leadership. Um, Zara, you talked about um, being sort of thrown into the deep end and learning a lot of stuff really quickly, and I think that there are a lot of people in DSA who have had that experience. Um, that was my experience in DSA. Um, was, you know, going to one meeting and like, you know, a week and a half later suddenly being in charge of two committees. Um, it's great. <laughs> um, but I think that um, we, we, we really need to always center that question. Um, and for, for the electoral work that I've been involved in, the, the piece that's been really exciting, is um, I think really a lot of it is the field work. And this isn't to say that fundraising isn't important uh, to Sandy's point earlier. It's very important. Comms is very important. Uh, data work is very important. All these things are very important. But the field work is um, where people who come in for the first time, that is often where they land. That's where their first experience is. Um, and then the other thing about field work that's very important is it teaches us how to talk to people at doors. It teaches us how to talk to regular voters. And our strategies, our scripts can then become grounded in what people are actually thinking and feeling and living at doors because we're talking to them. Um, and I think that that's a really, really critical and important piece of our electoral work. And I think one thing that, that has been very important um, in New York and I think in lots of other places is that for anyone who is able doing that field work, knocking on doors, talking to voters, is really important regardless of what else you are, you are also doing because it grounds all of us and connects all of us to what regular people are experiencing. So um, I think our goal with the electoral work is we're telling people that we are still in control of our lives. Like your city council is not this ominous group of people that are, don't have to answer to anyone or anyone in the community, right? So when we're knocking on doors, Tasha, right? Like Tasha said, when we're going to the doors, that's where we're cultivating our message because we're hearing what people are responding to if we're saying, hey, city council wants to give the police department 30 more million dollars, how do you feel about that? And then we can go from there. But um, yes, yeah, so our go for electoral work should be similar to our issue work, labor and tenant work. We want to take something that matters to people and tie it to their ability to change that by working with other people. From there, our goal has to be introduce new skills, experience, and relationships to those people and associate those with DSA. Um, and because of our electoral work, 
in the past, we've been getting the goods present day. Uh, Greg Abbott, our terrible governor, is currently occupying the city of Austin with uh, state troopers. And the state troopers are pulling people over for all kinds of BS, um, paper tax, uh, inspired tax, CBD in their car, and these people are going to court. But we endorsed Jose Garza for DA two years ago, and because we have Jose in that office, he's letting all these people go. No tickets, no court, petty fines, and, um, and it's definitely like we're endorsing a DA as a socialist, but he is um, bringing in bosses that are committing wage theft, and that's what we want, right? Uh, he's making sure people are not getting deported by ICE, and so I just believe with our electoral work, there needs to always be a long-term goal. Like, why are we putting this person in office? Why are we putting this initiative on the ballot? Like, what are we really trying to accomplish with this? I just personally really love the full gamut of answers that we just heard because I feel like we heard kind of all pieces of it. We heard about learning about the importance of things like money. We learned about growth and development, which is such an important part of why we do electoral work, developing individual member capacity, bringing in new people to the org and getting them right to work um, on field. And obviously, we win things. We win things that are material gains for the working class as well. So that's one of the great things about electoral work is that you can do all of that, plug people right in, um, and grow the, grow the movement and get wins at the same time, which is incredible. Um, OK, great. So let's move on um, to our next question. So you know, we, um, as socialists, as members of DSA, are kind of we're doing really great work kind of slotting into the existing systems. Um, but there's a lot of talk in DSA about eventually building independent power, independent infrastructure. Um, so how do y'all think that we should agitate and build for independent socialist politics? And what would constitute the steps towards getting there? How do we build to that? So internally and in practice, I think a lot of times when we look at this question, we sort of end up talking about tiers where endorsed candidates, um, you know, are the, the more socialist you are, the more cadre you are, the more endorsement you get. Um, and I am not necessarily against that, right? Um, but I am against tiers where the only difference is the verb that you use. Um, I feel like most people in the world read that DSA has endorsed Jane Doe, but DSA recommends a vote for John Smith, and they go, oh, okay, DSA has endorsed Jane Doe and John Smith, right? Like, there, there have to be resources behind it, or else it's a distinction without a difference. Um, so in Chicago, every endorsed candidate received a share of our PAC money just for being endorsed. Um, but we also had a second set of requirements to be considered on our slate. Um, those were that you, that candidates cross endorse every other person that was endorsed by DSA and that you share our, your canvassing data with us. Um, so if you were on the slate, you were eligible for additional money to the tune of thousands and thousands of dollars for in effect collaborating more closely with us, organizing more closely with us. Um, but it is, I really want to underline that it is not possible to tell one person, I like you, I want to give you $300, and another person, I really like you, I want to give you $700, unless you have $1,000 to give, right? <laughs> like, uh, it, it, these kind of requests for closer collaboration, these kind of requirements, they don't mean anything until you get your paper up. Um, in the main DSA, these are growing pains that we are still currently going through. Uh, in 2020, we turned out for various members of the Portland City Council, one of whom, April Fournier, uh, after we had knocked doors for her, went around, uh, turned around after election and voted against hazard pay. Um, that precipitated a conversation at the beginning of this year. Um, at our annual meeting uh, to discuss how it is that we actually want to go about endorsements, ultimately with the hope of developing a more sophisticated endorsement process. Part of that resolution was deciding that we're not going to rubber stamp anyone if we're making the claim that we are going to 
endorse someone or going to support someone for office, that has, that has material repercussions. That means we're putting money on the line for that. And more immediately, it means we're putting boots on the ground for that candidate. Um, we've got an, um, an electoral endorsement working group currently developing that process of what is Maine DSA's criteria for endorsing a candidate, but that is still a work in progress. As it is, we've only got one member of the main uh, um, main state, uh, excuse me, one main state representative, Grayson Luckner, he is out there fighting the fight on his own. We would love to have more support for him at the Augusta State House, but this is something that takes a long time to develop. In the meanwhile, what we have found the most immediate results with is, of course, de direct democracy is through the referendum process. Um. So I think the answer for me is, uh, we've heard it a little bit, Zoran gave um, a great speech about it, but uh, uh, building socialist in office committees, um, organizing with electeds and building really strong inside outside campaigns, I think is a way that we can do this. Um, I, I, I think that uh, I, I was really lucky. I, I actually never wanted to work in the legislature at all. Um, in hindsight, it wasn't even like the best fit for me in terms of like how I wanted to spend my time um, and my strengths. But I really, really, um, when Farrah Forrest won, I really wanted to have the experience of what it was like and understand what that next step was because it felt like, okay, we're able to win elections now, what do we do with this power? Because I think a lot of times um, people on the left are scared to have power and figure out what to actually do with it. It's really hard. And I really wanted to be a part of that. And so I was um, a part of um, the first year of New York Socialist in Office Committee. And I think what I learned, especially because I was on the, the legislator side, um, for that experience is how in, in insanely hard it is to be um, a left socialist legislator going into a body that is designed to crush you. Um, everything about it is designed to separate you from others if you disagree. Um, and as Zoran said earlier, really the only thing that you have to lean on is our organization if that committee exists. So that was that's that's something that I just think is is incredibly true. I learned so much through that experience, so many things I never would have under, understood prior to that. Um, I think the other thing that um, organizing with our electeds in such a way and building that kind of trust um, does is it gives us so many more platforms to bring people in and talk to people um, about things that they don't know about. I think I think you know, we really can't under, underestimate how depoliticized most people are and how little most people know about, especially, I mean, you talk about state government, um, and I'm talking about myself 10 years ago, you know, I didn't know anything. I didn't know what the assembly did. Um, and I think my experience is that when people start to learn about like, oh, the assembly is only in session for half the year, what are they doing in the second half of the year? Oh, you mean like committees can't just like bring up what they want and vote on it and send it for a vote? That's like, that seems like that's how it should work. Um, when people start to learn about this stuff, it changes them and I think it politicizes them. And when we are organizing inside and outside, we have this incredible opportunity to like bring in lots of people and start um, pulling the curtain back and showing people how politics works, how it's broken and how we en masse can, can start to fix it. Um, I'm not gonna pretend like I know how to build a socialist party in Texas. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know what we're gonna do on the federal or state level, but I think locally, we, with canvassing, we are building trust in our neighborhood. So we're not gonna endorse our people who don't identify as socialists and they never have, but because we have been pretty consistent about doing campaigns every six to eight months, people recognize us and they are beginning to trust us and I think building that, that trust with just regular people who don't have any really poli uh, real political theory at all, I think that's really where we gotta start. Um, so yeah, that's all I got on that one. All right, thank you. Um, and I just realized that we just keep going in the same order, so how about for this next question, we'll go in reverse, that mm -hmm. work? Okay, 
Yeah, you can tell I, I have a lot of experience facilitating panels. <laughs> um, okay, so um, one of the things that is exciting about electoral work is that it's an arena that we do pretty well at. Socialists um, in DSA have gotten pretty good at running campaigns, identifying good strategic terrain to run on, um, and we know how to organize, so we're good at winning those campaigns. That being said, um, as socialists, we are always under siege um, on all sides. Everything that we do is really challenging. Um, so I'd like to hear from the panel, um, what do you consider to be the biggest threats to socialism and to the working class? Um, and when you kind of think about your answer, think in terms of, of material conditions, concentrations of power, um, systemic forces, those kinds of things. Um, how, how do you define the forces that are the biggest threats to socialism, and how do you fight those? Um, our biggest threats, um, the stripping away of our bodily autonomy that's happening right now, climate change, um, kids losing their uh, ability to not work in factories, just like all this terrible shit that's happening, uh, despair, uh, the ongoing pandemic, um, yeah, just like constant capitalism's really on our asses right now, right? So I think the only thing we can do is just keep fighting. Like we've gotten this far and it feels like there hasn't been any progress, but there has been. Like people are so much more willing to have conversations about police budgets when five years ago the answer was like, no, you just write them a check and you don't ask any questions about it, right? Um, homelessness, is so bad, but with rent going up for everyone, I feel like it's kind of slapping people in the face, like, oh, this is not an individual problem, this is something that we're all experiencing right now. And I think the collective hurt that we're experiencing can be the fire that can keep us organizing, get more people into the socialist um, world. I agree with all of that. Um, I, I, um, I mean, I, I think I'd like to look at this, you know, a little personally in that, you know, I think we're in a different political moment than we were in a few years ago. It's harder to um, get volunteers. It's harder to raise money. Um, you know, we've talked about how membership has, has uh, plateaued or a, a little bit um, and all that stuff. And I think that, uh, there are just there are obviously a lot of a lot of things that are challenges. I think um, right now, uh, I feel it. A lot of people feel it. Uh, climate change is really terrifying and really really demoralizing and really hard to imagine um, ways to fight it. Um, and I think this past summer we've seen this like escalate across the globe pretty quickly. Um, I think affordability is a huge issue for, for so many people. It's harder and harder to live our lives. It's harder and harder to afford to stay um, in the place that you grew up in or, wh or whatever it is or um, afford to buy food and pay the rent. Um, everything is becoming a lot harder and I think when things are harder in that way, it's harder to live your life. It's harder just to make ends meet. There's this like existential crisis happening, um, that is a huge threat to organizing because those things are very demobilizing um, and very scary. Um, and I think I've been thinking about this a lot myself for the last year because I feel all of these things. Um, and I think for me, I, I, I really try to think about how can we make our organizing and our campaigns open up a sense of the possible for people and help people feel hopeful about things because I can say for sure, and I know I'm not the only one, that, that the reason I've spent so much time in DSA is because it is the thing that I feel hopeful about in my life. Um, and, uh, it energizes my life um, and gives purpose to it. Um, and I think that it's a real avenue for a lot of people feeling that. Um, but we, 
we have to continue to think about how we create spaces and ways where we're inviting people in and make it really easy for people to join something and learn something and feel like they can be a part of something. Um, and also feel like they're a part of something that can win and change things, which I also think is really important. Like we have to be very serious and very strategic um, with our campaigns. Um, and I think that when people join things like that and feel a sense of hope and feel like they're a part of something that can actually change people's lives, it's transformative for people and can politicize them for a really long time. Um, certainly we could spend all day recounting the myriad cruelties imposed on people by capitalism. Um, one of the things about neoliberal orthodoxy is that it promises nothing but the end of history. It assures you that there simply is no political horizon left and in a slightly cynical way that makes our job much easier because we can promise people anything and have that mean something when their usual assurance is that there is simply nothing left to be done as things are is exactly how they will be forever. So I think we need to contend more immediately with the competing visions for a political horizon and in Maine at least, um, as the whitest state in America, we tend to uh, be almost a bit of a mecca for Nazis, like people who will use the term national socialist full-throatedly as this is where we can build our ethno state. Um, you will see people out on corners with signs that say it is okay to be white. Um, and those people will, when presented with the opportunity, attempt to co-opt some of the language that they see working for us. I mean, it was the same strategy imposed by the National Socialists in Germany in the 1930s. Um, I see brown populism be being used to divide the working class as the greatest threat to the building of socialism, the best shot that the forces of reaction have of truly poisoning the well. An example from Maine that springs to mind uh, a couple months ago, Portland uh, is an extremely expensive city. Um, we, about one out of every 50 people in Portland is spending some part of the year out on the streets. There's a major, major homelessness crisis in Portland itself. Um, Historically, um, a very white state, we've seen, uh, there's been a large influx of, especially with the Sudanese Civil War, um, a large influx of African migrants, and this has mobilized the uh, most like racist reactionary forces in the state. The tact that I've seen that gives me the most concern is uh, a man named Richard Ward, a Nazi in Portland, going out to the homeless camps, the white homeless camps, and handing out food, handing out material aid, and telling these people that you are in direct competition for these resources with these newly displaced migrants. To my mind, the biggest threat facing socialism is climate change. Um, it is endless wars, it is COVID killing thousands upon thousands of people, for-profit healthcare uh, leading to people dying of preventable disease, prison and police brutality. Um, the world that we have right now kills countless working class people who may, may not, but may have been organized in their workplaces and communities and who are now just gone. Um, if this answer seems a little callous, please know that the ruling class is at the very least indifferent about committing class genocide, if not actively in favor of it. Um, and we need to understand that every single day our climate gets warmer represents thousands of working people who at least had the potential to fight back and that potential is now gone. So... Yeah, we are beset on all sides. We have a lot of challenges facing us. Um, capitalism is, um, it just hits you from every possible side, mentally, material conditions. Um, so 
We know that we can't overturn all of that um, in an instant, if, if only we could. We're good, at, we're good at winning campaigns, but we've got to build for the long term, and it's a long fight. So this question is about the long term, and you know, through the electoral lens, how do we organize for the long term? Um, what counts as winning, and how do we build on losses and wins for greater gain? Um. With the electoral work, we need to be um, have more intensive touches with people that we're knocking on the door. I'm like, I don't knock on your door, and then you only see me once a year for whatever campaign. Like, we're coming back and checking on you, and we're going to get you into the org. We need to be more deliberate about one-on-ones and like making sure that our comrades who are paper members become active members, so the rest of us aren't getting burnt out, right? Um, and like right now, it feels like more work because you get off of work and like, shit, I have a meeting. Now I have to call three people and make sure they're going to actually show up to this thing that they're going to do. But it's worth it. Like, it. like it feels like a hassle in the moment, but I think it's totally worth it for us to use as much as our time as possible building this socialist experiment because we really have no choice. Um, and I know you said concentrating on electoral work, but also long term, like we're not going to do anything unless we are organizing our workplaces and getting every single employed person to a union in this country. Um, like we have to have rank and file members and that's where we're going to have an actual um, socialist revolution, I believe. Um, well, I think the first thing I want to say is the incredible thing about our organization is that there are so many people doing different things in different tracks. And I think that first and foremost, that's what we need to be doing is like learning how and pushing forward many different um, things at the same time that all intersect um, and are connected to each other. And, and that like without a doubt for me is the most exciting thing about this organization because we're doing that. Um, I, I think, um, I mentioned it before, I think like the thing that's very different about our electoral work from um, most other electoral work that happens in this country is that we have an organization behind it um, and we're, we're um, I didn't, I, I stole this from somebody, but we're an organization that builds campaigns rather than campaigns trying to build an organization. Um, and I think that that's really important because that gives us um, the infrastructure and the institutional knowledge and the relationships to pull people into politics through campaigns and keep them there through other campaigns and other work, um, legislative work, labor work, um, et cetera. Uh, and I think um, for me, a really exciting example of this um, that I feel really fortunate to have been a part of was the first Tax the Rich campaign in New York City, um, New York State, sorry. Uh, and uh, uh, when we talk about what counts as a win and what counts as a loss, it was, it was a really interesting campaign. Uh, I, I was not involved in the beginning of it. The Debt and Finance Working Group really built this incredible package of bills. Um, it was somewhat complicated because it has to do with the budget um, and then people had to understand what the budget was and then people had to understand how the budget is passed in Albany, which is a ridiculous process that I learned later when I, or no, I learned that later that the next year when I worked in Albany that there were staff members who had worked in Albany for years who didn't understand the budget process in Albany. Um, and uh, the debt and finance working group spent months um, holding trainings for legislators, for staff, for members, for anyone interested in this process and how utterly fucked our uh, tax system was in New York State um, and what these bills were designed to do and about the 50, the campaign was to raise $50 billion in new revenue. Um, and there was ongoing political education of this sort throughout the campaign um, and a lot of coordination with the electeds, um, inside outside strategy. The thing that I think is was really interesting, one of the things I learned was that by the end of the campaign, we didn't win $50 billion. That's a lot of money, but absolutely it could be raised. But we did win, I think it was like four and a half 
billion, um, which is huge, and that was a win. We didn't win everything, but we won some of it. And what I loved about that campaign, and again, I wasn't the one doing these trainings, I just, I saw it happen, I was like, this is incredible, this is something we need to replicate, is that because there was so much learning around this subject, um, our members and people who had come in through the organization through this campaign knew so much about the complexities of it that they understood that this was a win and there was a lot of stuff we didn't win. Um, and that was extremely mo like motivating and exciting, but also we were like there was a sense of like sobriety around like where we still needed to go. And so I think we have to have very sober, energizing campaigns that keep people in for the long term and, and help build a long term narrative. I think what long-term electoral victory for the, uh, for the Democratic Socialists of America will look like is winning every single thing that can't, every gain that can be got through electoral strategy such that it is incontrovertible the critical issues facing the working class in this country that cannot be won through electoral means. We need um, to be able to force the question of what just vote cannot get us and through developing our electoral strategy, um, build out the capacity to actually win those gains when the state will simply not permit it. Obviously, we are not there yet. Um, there is a great deal of militancy that still can be learned through our electoral organizing. Um, but once we get to a point where we can achieve broad support for our political aims, only for the state to say no, that we in turn can just say no to that. So a unique quality of electoral work is that you know when you've won because you versus how many, sorry, uh, because you know when you've won because there is a set date and time at which you must count how many support people support you versus how many support the other guy and you win when you have more people. That is not the case with a lot of organizing that we do. A lot of uh, organizing that we do is over the course of years and years and very vibe based with elections. There is an election date, it happens. Um, and that's, not to say that that's the only way that we win. I truly do not believe that elections are the only way that we win. However, the set, date, time, etc., cetera, um, really means that wins beget more winning. People are more likely to dedicate their time, money, and mental energy to projects that they believe have a chance in hell of winning. Um, the ability to say, we are popular, we have won, we plan to continue winning in the future with your help, is extremely persuasive. You know, and I don't say this to say that we just focus on getting the W and then we don't care about what happens afterwards. We know that the simple fact of, of being in office is a conservatizing force um, and that we don't want to cede any ground. What I am saying is that the wins that we do have are an organizing tool. We ought to use them as an organizing tool. Take wins as you get them broadcast them to the masses, saying that we are going to keep on winning with no plans of stopping. Join us, make our next wins even bigger. I really love that. I really love talking about, um, you know, the, 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 the purpose of doing our electoral organizing, obviously, like you said, is not just for the wins, but we are organizing human beings, right, in every part of our socialist organizing. And just the impact emotionally of those wins is so huge. Even in our losses, you know, when Bernie lost in 2016, 2020, a lot of, a lot of DSA members got super involved in those, in those um, organizing efforts. And even though they ultimately weren't successful, they were like, great, we can't wait to take everything that we learned and put it back into practice um, where we are locally. Um, and chapters around the country are doing that. And it's so incredible. Um, so love talking about wins. Um, so, okay, um, we've got one more question from up here and then we're gonna go to um, audience Q&A. 
Um, so for this last one, let's go back to our original order, break it up a little bit. Um, so this is kind of a question about uniting DSA, which I think is a really interesting question here at convention. Um, we are doing this grand democratic exercise that you know many people who like to make jokes about leftists would say is impossible, but we gather a thousand of us in a room and we debate, we deliberate, we make motions, we vote. Um, sometimes it's messy, sometimes it's contentious, but at the end of the day, we are building this organization for the future. And we are building the organization in a way that, even though there can be contentious debates, ultimately unites us against the real enemies. So um, I wanna know from each of y'all's perspectives, uh, what do you think has united DSA over the last two years? And what can unite DSA over the next two years? Um, so the last two years have been tough. <laughs> the last two years have been real tough. But when we're looking at what has united DSA over the past two years, my involvement with the Strike Ready at UPS campaign has truly been some of the most activated and united I've seen people in a long time, maybe since Bernie 2020. And, and don't we love that? Don't we love one electoral project, one labor project being, uh, being the uh, big uniting factors? Um, but I think that when DSA does things well, when DSA is united, we see a couple of things in common. We see, for one thing, we see engagement ladders where people can plug in and participate at anywhere from five, five hours a month to 80 hours a week. Uh, don't do that, but you could, theoretically, right? <laughs> so, so engagement ladders that, that really um, are, do a variety of tactics, a variety of level of involvement. Um, two, we see really robust political education. Nothing made me more excited about Bernie than learning about Eugene Debs, and nothing made me more excited about a potential 23 UPS strike than learning about the 97 strike. Mm -hmm. And in both is, you know, being able to look at, at previous uh, things and do really exciting political education, I think is always really huge. And third, um, in both of these cases, DSA didn't start the ball rolling. External forces were in motion, but DSA was able to get involved, really push it into high gear, sort of Katamari Damashi ourselves onto it, um, and with uh, bring in our socialist messaging and our analysis with us. Um, I don't really know if I have like a grand theory of what unifies us, um, but I think we can look into the recent past and see these features and see these features in common and look for things that include these things in the, in the future. Those being snowballing the working class that's already in motion, enlightening and exciting political education, and a really wide breadth of how people can get involved and to what extent. I think that DSA definitely does need to capitalize on the opportunities presented to it. I think Bernie 2020 is the pivotal example here. Without that campaign, we would not have hit the heights of our membership, but there are real risks to tying our identity so closely to one political project, especially one that is so unfortunately deeply linked to the Democratic Party. <laughs> um, the the drop-off in membership that we saw after that is, I think, what the real jeopardy of those kinds of political projects are tying DSA's identity nationally so closely to a specific election cycle. For these reasons, I think that labor is a much more um, reliable means of base building. However, where we have found the greatest success in involving ourselves with labor is using the capacity that we've developed through our electoral programs. I know in Maine, at least, the strike ready camp, like the lists of supporters, the lists of people who would be willing to contribute to strike funds, the people who will pick up the phone when you call them, the, that's information that we were able to suss out from our work with electoral strategy, and that was able to get the ball rolling with the strike ready campaign. Um, I think that um, I'll echo the sentiment about political education being something that is and like needing to like constantly renew education is 
something that is a, 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 a reliable source for our base itself. Election cycles are great for building out the organization, but that's kind of the danger of them is that they do get called at a certain point. And then you're gonna need to know that the people who are putting in 10, 20, 80 hours a week during that election cycle are still gonna show up for the meetings on Monday, are still gonna pick up the phone when you call them, are still going to want to help build the socialist project. Um, so I think uh, what unites us is uh, organizing and working together, uh, and especially organizing and working together on strategic campaigns and projects um, that win change. Um, I really loved the beginning of today um, during the speeches and seeing the rundown on the screen and listening to everyone uh, announce all of the various projects and wins that have been going on across the country in all of the different chapters um, and seeing those chapters like stand up and applaud and, and like hug each other and like that's that's what's bringing us together and that's what is uniting us, is all of this collective work that we're doing to change this world um, and to change our lives and the lives of others. Um, and so I think that the challenge is how do we keep doing this and how do we continue to bring people in while doing this and grow that and bring more, invite and, and uh, yeah, keep more people um, in our organization. Uh, and I think that, um, we just need to continue to do the things that we've done successfully, um, even though it is a harder political moment. I think uh, it's, it's not a time to sort of abandon things that have worked really well for us, but to really hone in on our strengths and make sure we continue to be strategic, continue to build campaigns that are exciting, that are popular, that people notice who are not in the organization and don't understand socialist politics yet. Um, but they can understand like, yes, I want to be able to stay in my home um, or yeah, I can't afford healthcare, like healthcare costs are getting out of control, any number of things. Uh, I think, uh, and I think electoral, um, again, is a place where we can marry a lot of that because I think electoral campaigns are also an avenue to talk about these things and to connect with people about these issues um, and to elevate these issues so that then when we are focusing on specific issues, uh, we have already built, as everyone on this panel has talked about, relationships with people, they've seen us, um, and there's a continuity from our electoral work to our legislative work to our labor work, and it's all like interconnected. But I mean, I think the short version is like, we're here to work together because that's like us uniting around that is what's, is what's bringing us together and why we're here. Um, and I just think we really need to continue to, to think about how we keep people in this organization and attract new people. Um, I think materially what has united us in the past few years and what will continue to unite us into our next convention is hating the police and hating our bosses. Um, <laughs> There, there is no good police department in this country. Every police department has a very large budget. I think we should all be working on our city budgets and making sure that we can take as much money as possible from these people. Um, with Ewok, I think that really united us uh, during the pandemic, and I think we should continue growing Ewok and continue with our uh, strike funds and just like really uplifting all our comrades who are like, hey, I wanna organize my workplace. What does that look like? And help them do that. Um, but yeah, so f fuck the cops and fuck the bosses. All right. Um, thanks so much, y'all. So we've got about 15 minutes left for Q&A. Um, so, folks, if you have a question that you'd like to ask our panel, we've obviously got an, a really amazing array of experiences and perspectives here. So if you've got any questions for our panel, um, why don't we either, if you can make it to one of the microphones on the sides of the room, that's great. If you would like, one to, if you would like someone to bring one to you, Ali can do that. Um, so just raise your hand. 
um, if you need a mic, or you can make your way over. I think I see one comrade back there, a couple over here. Okay, so why don't we, we'll, we'll switch sides. Um, comrade, why don't you go ahead? Thank you. Uh, I've heard a lot of really excellent electoral approaches from the speakers, uh, but I do wonder how to address the single greatest split within DSA, what our, our, what our electoral strategy is in relation to the Democrats. Are we their left wing, or are we a force for independent workers? Bernie had us united, but now we don't have Bernie. This question is often avoided in the name of unity, but we're much stronger when we try to answer it. Could you please speak directly to which strategy we should take in relationship to the Democrats? Any of our panelists want to jump in? I have no idea. <laughs> That's what we were going to do. Actually, but I think it might be easier to just. I mean, I think the circumstances are very different from state to state, and every chapter is dealing with very, very different circumstances. So, um, I think that we have to make sure we continue um, and protect our electoral work in a way that allows chapters to determine how to relate to the Democratic Party, to their candidates, in a way that makes sense for their individual circumstances. I don't think there is a one-size-fits-all prescriptions for, for prescription for all the chapters. I have absolutely no interest whatsoever in being the left wing of the Democratic Party. Uh, they are... That's not, that's not my circus. That's, those aren't my monkeys. Um, I think that that is completely unrelated to the question of whether we sometimes have a D next to our name, a thing that, that uh, sometimes is the smartest thing to do just so you can get on the ballot. Um, I think there's certainly no question that we don't need to earn the support of the Democratic Party. However, there are local state Democratic parties which are a bit looser with their, their uh, a bit looser with their resources. They'll kick some money if they think it's a, if they think something sounds good. In the case of uh, Maine DSA in Portland, we ask basically nothing of the local Democratic Party except like we'll send them an email. It's like, do you want to endorse this? And usually, at least in the case of this last one, they waited until the week before the election when it was already like very obvious that this that question A was not going to succeed. And then at that point once the Portland Press Herald had already produced their uh, endorsement, then they said, okay, yeah, you should, you should vote with the DSA on this one. Uh, but we keep our expectations very low. Certainly we're not trying to like curry favor with them. Okay, I'm uh, Daniel from DSA LA, and I was curious, um, how you maintain, maintain transparency in the local chapter's process of endorsements and deciding which campaigns to work on. Uh, I asked because last year me and a number of other DSA candidates were running for Congress and our local DSA had decided to really focus on uh, local races and some state races uh, but there wasn't really a clear consensus there, uh, and part of the process, in my opinion, was a little uh, biased by our electoral politics committee. And I'm wondering how you maintain transparency in that vein, and also, I guess, for the moderator, when it comes to national endorsements, which aid congressional candidates, are there talks of other options for candidates whose local chapters don't even want to take up the question of congressional races and therefore uh, per basically prevent local candidates who are running from Congress from being considered for the national endorsement? Um, so in Austin, we have an elected electoral research group. Um, you got to run for it, the body votes for you. And then the electoral research group, we look at the next year or so of what elections are coming up and see if there are any candidates that are even worth thinking about endorsing. We research, we interview the candidates, and then we bring it to the general body and we tell them um, what we came up with, where this person stands, what their position is, how it relates to our chapter, 
and we just let our body vote for it right then and there. So the, our electoral research group doesn't do any of the endorsements alone behind a closed door. Uh, we did run a congressional uh, campaign once and it was really hard. Um, I don't know what personal advice I give you for your chapter, but no one should take congressional races, federal races lightly. They're very expensive, they're very hard, and you're usually competing against people who have a lot more resources and money than we will ever have. So just don't take it lightly. Don't just wake up one day and say, I'm a socialist, I have the best ideas, I should run for Congress, and the people are gonna love me because that's not what's gonna happen. Um, I am delighted to learn that Chicago and Austin have this in common, um, but in Chicago we have a candidate development subcommittee. Um, actually, anyone can join it, um, but the, so Chicago has people who are researching what strategic races would be um, a year to 18 months in advance of, uh, of filing deadlines. Um, and so we, we start with the race first and look for the person second. We have literally done a thing where we say this, this seat is in a place with a high concentration of DSA members, the incumbent is being indicted, that happens a lot in Chicago. Um, you know, <laughs> like there are, are uh, it's open for X, Y, and Z thing. Who do we have who would be good? We are starting with the place and then trying to, to recruit people from there. Um, of course, it happens the other way. Of, obviously, candidates come to us requesting endorsement, which we um, take to a vote of the full membership after a robust debate. Um, but we do include the research that we did with the candidate endorsement subcommittee in that, you know, if someone comes to us with a request for an endorsement, we look at the research that we did for the race that they are running in. We look at, is this strategic? Is this something we have the capacity to do? Um, but we are trying the best we can to shift to a model where as much as possible we get the, the uh, uh, race first and the candidate second rather than the other way around. It's still a, a, a seesaw that we're working on, but that is, that is what we are trying to do, um, is to move away from a candidate-centric model. Yeah, I'll just quickly say also from the perspective of my chapter, you know, we're a, we're a mid-sized chapter in the South, North Carolina Triangle. Um, we started off our um, electoral work um, really by making a massive mistake when we got overeager and endorsed a, a cadre member for a U.S. House run that ended up being um, deeply demobilizing, um, was a lot of work, and um, really got, went absolutely nowhere. So one of the things that I really preach um, now that I'm on the NEC is when you're trying to decide what kinds of races your chapter should engage in, think really hard about your chapter capacity. Um, it is, you want to be looking for those strategic races that are high priority, but where you also have a membership core that can absolutely, using field, just change the game for that seat. Um, and as you build, you can start to think about how you can bring in more members and start to contest higher seats. But, um, you know, really, it's, uh, we have an incredible amount of enthusiasm for electoral work um, in this organization. It's really hard sometimes when we, you know, we don't endorse on the NEC. We don't endorse every application that comes to us. Um, and a lot of times it kind of comes down to capacity. Um, you really want to be careful um, that, to make sure that you're not going to be burning out your chapter um, and that you're kind of like thinking about what is realistic um, uh, within your chapter's capacity. Um, okay, let's go back to um, the other side of the room here. Next question. What's up? I'm Amara. <coughs> Sorry. What's up? I'm Amara from uh, the Metro DC chapter. And I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on what comes after the election. So, like, you've won, you've got these these DSA endorsed or supported electeds, what can we do as organizers to ensure that you know, they continue to represent our ideas? And, and what can we do, I guess, to ensure that DSA's endorsement is seen as something of value that they want to protect and, and keep? Um, I'm just going to re-up the Socialist in Office Committee right away on that. Um, I think uh, 
uh, my experience when I was working with Farah and she won her election is that she, you know, immediately started getting phone calls from um, all sorts of leadership in Albany and, and, and uh, lobbyists and it's a very overwhelming experience. Um, and so I think what happens after the election is all of the organizers involved in the election or a separate body of organizers including leadership um, from the chapter should form some sort of committee to help support that legislator navigating those, especially those months right after you win but before you have staff and you're just getting tons of phone calls and things are crazy. Um, and right from the beginning, just start to support them. Even if everyone on the committee is figuring it out for themselves for the first time, better to figure all that stuff out together um, than to have um, a newly elected legislator sort of out there in the wild, like trying to, to navigate this stuff on their own. So I just really can't emphasize that enough, like surround that person with support and knowledge and learning um, and try to build a socialist in office committee, I think. Um, just to switch hats for a little bit, um, I mentioned at the top that I used to be a legislative aide and I think that um, that experience is maybe more useful here even though I didn't do that as like a DSA, you know, at, in my capacity as a socialist. Just to say that being the person who um, runs an elected official's phone line and email line, um, no one calls and emails to say, hey, I think it's cool and fine that there's homeless people living out on the street. A lot of people will call and say, hey, I'm really pissed off that I had to see a homeless person today. Um, I like There are all, just the way that this is all set up um, means that once you are in office, you hear from people who are really angry about what even teensy tiny little good things you might want to want to do, and you never ever hear from people with a heart and soul. Um, and I know that like, I, I know, I know that like, call your legislator is like the ultimate liberal Bullshit, and, and, and that's not what I, it's not a replacement for real organizing, but I do think that keeping in mind what issues are important to us, what issues do we want to organize calls around, what, orga what issues do we want to organize email campaigns around, because they do not happen otherwise. They don't happen without, without people specifically saying, um, you know, without people specifically organizing for them. Um, and so I think that just keeping in mind that, yeah, that your, your city council person gets 50 calls a day saying, I had to look at a homeless person and I'm furious about that. What are you doing about that? Just keep that in mind. And one other quick thing that I'll add is that the question about what happens um, after a campaign, um, it's really important to be also thinking about that from the outset. So um, to the extent that you are able to, for example, um, talk to your candidate ahead of time, come to some sort of agreement or understanding about co-governance with the DSA, if that's a possibility. Um, set expectations clearly um, from the start. The more that you can do that, the better. Um, obviously, that requires having the, um, you know, the power and the leverage to, you know, we have to actually matter to the elected enough for, to be able to have that kind of relationship. Um, but that's the kind of work that we want to be doing. We want DSA endorsement to mean something. We want the relationship with DSA um, to be something that is beneficial um, both for the chapter and for the elected. And so that's another part of why it's important to be really tactical about um, choosing the races um, that you're endorsing. So if that answers your question, comrade. Um, okay, uh, it is 3.13. If, let's take maybe one more real quick. Um, I, I just want to say I, it's, it's difficult for me to see from here because um, y'all are so far away. I do want to see if there's, for this last question, if we can um, do a progressive stack sort of thing. Is there anybody um, who does not identify as a man or as a person of color who is in line who would like to ask a question? Um, if so, feel free to move to the Serena's front. Right do you have someone over there? I see Serena. Yeah. Serena. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> Great. Hi, all. My name is Serena. My pronouns are she, they. Um, and I just wanted to ask a really quick question. I really appreciated 
all of your discussions so far. I think it's really helped by a delegation who hasn't has tried running campaigns, and I think this is very good campaign sort of one-on-one, -on -one, but I want to move to campaign 102, where you talk about how we use our electoral strategy to build um, a party. Um, we do want to, given that we do want to see DSA um, as a vehicle for class struggle, um, I was wondering um, what is necessary for our organization to implement in the next two years to build a working class party? I can, I can talk about it a little bit from the NEC perspective. So, you know, most of what the NEC does is carry out the tactics um, based on the strategies that are laid out at conventions. So we're not really making a lot of those kinds of decisions um, ourselves. However, what I can tell you, what we're hearing from our chapters, I, th I feel like we're starting to see organically the kind of growth um, in infrastructure and structure that we need. So whether you're somebody who wants to break from the Democratic Party sooner or later, whether you're somebody who believes in the party surrogacy model, um, one, one way that I often just feel very comfortable giving the cop-out answer is that I feel like a great percentage of the work that needs to be done for, I, for any of those approaches to be successful is pretty similar. We need to be building our own independent um, structures and infrastructures. So, for example, the development of the socialists and office committees, that's the kind of thing, when we think about like, what a party is, you know, a party is sort of an entity that can hold, in theory, can hold its members in line, right? How do you do that? Well, you have to be able to build the kind of power and build the kind of relationships and the kinds of expectations with your elected so that you can sort of guide them in their work in office, um, have a relationship where there's a dialogue between DSA and the elected. So developments of things like that, I think, are a big part of it. Development of, um, you know, we, uh, data management, for example, like that's a big topic in DSA. Often when I debrief with um, chapters after, um, after their campaigns, and this, this, this happened in, in our first ever successful campaign in North Carolina. We had the same problem. We had this idea that we were gonna take all the data at the end of the campaign, um, put it into a form that was gonna be usable for, not just for electoral campaigns, but other sorts of organizing going forward. And what happened was after election day, um, everybody was exhausted and fell asleep for three weeks and we lost access to van and we lost a lot of that. So getting better at building out those kinds of tools and making sure that we have plans you know, from well before a campaign is launched to well after, those kinds of things I think will help us at least get us to the point where whatever path we end up deciding, we can be successful with.